Moving on to Brachyspira and the agents of swine dysentery. So Brachyspira hyodysenteriae and Hampsoni. Um, this is a condition which has really reemerged since the late 2000s. Um, prior to that, it was quite common in the 1990s and before, but sort of underwent this period of relative quiescence for reasons that we don't fully understand. Clinical signs associated with swine dysentery include, number one, diarrhea, which can vary in character from quite mild and watery to mucohemorrhagic with even fibrinous casts of the colon. Pigs are inappetent, they may be pyrexic, and we can see mortality in per acutely affected animals. Although anecdotally, this is something that was seen um, in previous decades and is less common now uh, with the strains that are currently circulating. This disease is most commonly seen in older pigs, so those grower finisher aged animals, and experimentally the incubation period is three to seven days from exposure to the development of disease. In these images here, you can see the variability of the character of diarrhea in pigs with swine dysentery. So it can be a very uh, profuse sort of hose pipe diarrhea that can be very watery, as you see here. It can be blood tinged, we can have frank blood, and we can have large sort of fibrinous casts, suggesting a lot of inflammation in the colon. These images were all um, collected during a trial where we attempted to fulfill Cox postulates um, with these novel uh, strains of Brachyspira. So Brachyspira hampsoni, or what became uh, Brachyspira hampsoni in, in more recent years. In this image here, uh, you can see a smear of pig feces with spirochetes. So this would be a gram-stained image. And I think you can appreciate where all these arrows are. We've got these nice squiggly little bacteria, and there's some other ones as well. So they're certainly visible on gram stain. They stand out better on wet mount where we can actually see their motility. So swine dysentery is classically caused by Brachyspira hyodysenteriae. This is what would have been seen until sort of the mid 2000s. Um, novel species have emerged over the last decade and Brachyspira hampsoni is now very common in Western Canada, um, more common than uh, Brachyspira hyodysenteriae. Anecdotally, the disease associated with Hampsoni is less severe than what was classically seen with hyodysenteriae in, for instance, the 1970s, when we would actually see much more mortality associated with these infections. Control of this disease is a bit of a challenge. Um, we don't know exactly where it comes from, whether it's carrier animals or wildlife. Um, antimicrobials have certainly been used in affected herds. And unfortunately, we have no vaccines available. Brachyspira pelosicoli uh, causes spirochetocolitis in pigs. Um, this is a less, se less severe diarrhea than swine dysentery. Um, in finishing pigs, we typically see diarrhea that has a wet cement consistency. So it's sort of pasty and, and like a cow patty, typically without frank blood. In younger animals, the diarrhea can be a bit more severe. It can be more watery or mucoid. It's typically self-limiting. And the primary concern with this, other than obviously animal welfare, is that it's a, a production limiting disease. So we see poor feed efficiency, poor conversion of feed to weight. Control relies on similar tools to swine dysentery. So antimicrobials, fortunately we have no vaccine and then just generally good management practices. So all in all out uh, supply of animals and controlling other concurrent diseases to keep a healthy population that's perhaps less susceptible. In birds, we can see infections caused by a variety of species. Brachyspira alvinopulli is associated with wet feces to diarrhea. So a whole range of clinical signs um, and green, yellow, frothy cecal fluid. Brachyspira pelosicoli um, colonizes the cecum and is associated with mucosal thickening and perhaps poor feed conversion. And then Brachyspira hyodysenteriae is also associated with disease in birds um, and has been reported to cause severe necrotizing typhlitis, so inflammation of the cecum, in juvenile rheas. Um, these are birds that are related to ostriches and emus, like you can see over here on the right. People can also be infected with Brachyspira, um, and the disease in us is known as intestinal spirochetosis. 
classically, it's been associated with Brachyspira pelosicoli and alborgi. Um, alborgi, the name comes from where it was discovered, so here in Alborg in Denmark. In developing countries, colonization of people with Brachyspira is quite common, um, up to 30% of the population. In developed countries, it's most commonly seen as a cause of infections among children, HIV positive patients, and men who have sex with men. These infections are infrequently recognized, but when they are, signs are associated with the GI tract. So chronic diarrhea with or without blood, cramping, and colitis. Our last genus that we're going to talk about is Treponema um, as a cause of digital dermatitis in cattle. This is a polymicrobial infection of the bovine foot, and it can present with either proliferative or erosive lesions. And for proliferative lesions, they're colloquially known as hairy heel warts. These infections are generally treated topically. Um, for early lesions, washing and perhaps hoof trimming can be sufficient, while for more severe disease, antibiotics may also be warranted. In these images here, you can see the variability of lesions associated with digital dermatitis in cattle. In our first image here, you can see uh, a small sort of early lesion associated with treponema. In this picture here, we have a more uh, advanced lesion with sort of some chronic ulceration. Here we have a healing lesion. Um, and in this image here, we also have a healing lesion, but with more proliferation. Finally, in our last image here, you can see a more chronic lesion with also ulceration. For sample collection and handling, uh, Lawsonia, you want to collect feces or rectal swabs, potentially ileal tissue collected at necropsy. For Brachyspira, rectal swabs are much better than feces, um, so the organism lives in the colonic crypts, and you're much more likely to detect or recover the organism from a swab which actually uh, touches the mucosal epithelium as opposed to feces in the lumen of the colon. You can also collect tissues at necropsy, whether from the colon or cecum. For treponema, uh, swabs or potentially tissue biopsies for microscopy is really useful. Not freezing these samples is key, um, particularly to grow brachyspira. Um, if we are going to be doing molecular tests, sample handling is somewhat less critical. Identification of Lawsonia is largely based on histological examination, so we use special staining techniques like silver stain, and we can also do PCR on feces or colonic tissues. For Brachyspira, there's a whole range of assays that are available, from microscopy, culture, PCR-based assays, and then of course sequencing, um, which is really the gold standard for a species-level ID. For treponema, typically we don't bother speciating these organisms. It's microscopically identified. Working with Brachyspira can be a really challenging and long drawn out procedure. So from our initial sample, whether that's diarrhea or colonic tissues, um, when culturing these, we start by uh, culturing them on selective media. So we use BJ agar and also CVS agar, which contain antimicrobials. Because these bacteria don't form colonies as we expect with most other organisms, it can be challenging to ensure that we have a pure culture. And so we subculture for purity by passaging the organism, selecting an isolated zone of hemolysis, subculturing that onto a new plate, incubating, and repeating again and again and again. Ultimately, we go to broth culture, which is where we can do um, some additional assays so we can extract DNA for identification. Um, or potentially do susceptibility testing. Depending on how much of this process is done at a diagnostic lab, we can have preliminary results in under a week and final results potentially with some susceptibility information after about three weeks. So it's very time consuming. Zoonotic transmission is very poorly understood. Um, we do not know what the origin is of human infections with Brachyspira species. Um, between animals, transmission seems likely. Um, the role of wildlife um, in agricultural settings has been widely speculated upon, whether it's rats, mice, or wild birds. Um, but again, we really lack very clear data. One study that I had the opportunity to connect, conduct a few years ago was looking at uh, snow geese in Nunavut. So these were birds which were swabbed up in the Canadian Arctic where they spend their summers. 
Um, they then fly south for the winter to the Midwestern United States, where there's a very large population of pigs and potentially where they have contact. Um, what we found is that Brachyspira, uh, very similar to porcine strains, were found in geese, potentially suggesting that we have transmission. So the birds come down for the summer, hang out with pigs, they go back up to the Arctic where we sampled them um, and recovered uh, similar strains. But I don't think we have a holistic understanding of exactly the role of these uh, wildlife species and the epidemiology of this agricultural disease, but there's at least something that warrants following up on. As far as treatment options go, uh, for Lawsonia, susceptibility testing is impossible. These are obligate intracellular parasites, and we simply can't do our normal susceptibility tests on them. Penicillins, aminoglycosides, vertinamycin, and the ionophores are ineffective, and so therapy has historically relied on the macrolides and pleuromutilins. For Brachyspira, um, in pigs, treatment also relies very heavily on the macrolides and pleuromutilins. And although we can grow these organisms, we lack standardized methods for conducting and interpreting uh, antimicrobial susceptibility testing on this genus. This has actually been an active area of research in my lab for some years. Um, it's a very challenging test to do. It's incredibly laborious. You can see here stacks of uh, agar plates, blood agar plates with antibiotics incorporated into them, and we're spotting on bacterial cultures incubating them for 24 to 48 hours and looking for growth indicated by the presence of these hemolytic zones. So it's incredibly um, time consuming, tedious, and quite expensive um, to try and implement this in a diagnostic setting. If you are interested, you can read uh, more about our method in this paper here published just in June of 2023. In our research, we've used the agar dilution method because it's really the reference for testing anaerobic bacteria. Um, here you can see we have uh, different plates. We have blood agar uh, plates with varying amounts of antimicrobials. Our control plate has no drug, 0 0.25, 0 0.51248, 4, and 16 micrograms per milliliter of the antibiotic we're interested in. We spot on our bacterial uh, suspension, and you can see we have these hemolytic zones following incubation um, on our control plate. As the concentration of antibiotics goes up, you can see those hemolytic zones get smaller and smaller until they finally disappear. And this allows us to describe a minimum inhibitory concentration for each organism for each drug. So we don't have any new terms today, but I do have a couple of questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.